Welcome to the Protagonist Pub. My name is Tammy. And as usual, my dogs are talking. And this is where characters gather. So today I'm going to start the um, vlog for Dracula. I was going to read this in September, but there was already enough going on, and this fits perfectly in with Victober, so I moved Dracula to September, to October. I have two versions of the book. I have the critical, um, what is this called? Ignatius Critical Edition version. This is annotated and filled with footnotes, which if you know me as a reader is not my favorite way to read a book, especially if I haven't read it before and I have not read Dracula before. I don't know if you can see this, but there's, you know, an example of footnotes. And so I also have the leather bound edition from Barnes and Noble, which, you know, is appropriately gothic and creepy and you know like all Barnes and Noble leather bound editions this one is beautiful and this is unannotated and I am very much looking forward to this now and if you can hear the bird screaming I greatly apologize I am, however, um, confused. So this has Dracula ending girls knock it off on page 281. So it's not, you know, it's a third of the book. And, and then there are other, you know, books included. So there is Dracula. Then there's the Jewel of the Seven Seas, the Lair of the White Worm, Dracula's Guest and Other Stories, which appears to be a collection of short stories. So... I am guessing that Dracula itself is not super long. I, however, cannot tell you that for sure because if I open the Ignatius Critical Press Edition, see if they have a table of contents. They have the text of Dracula as 496 pages. That is, you know... Let's just be generous and say a 200 page difference. And it doesn't include the short stories or the Jewel of Seven Seas. So I, I do not know what the actual text of Dracula is. I need to do some research and figure that out, which I have not done yet. I need to compare the two editions and see what the difference is. Uh, it, it, it is confusing. I do not understand why this is so bizarre. I, I, I really don't. So this has a total of 27 chapters for Dracula. And this has a total of... This one doesn't break it into chapters. Yes, it does. 27 chapters. So, um, 281 pages versus 496 pages. Uh, there is a whopping difference there. I mean, the text size isn't that different between the two books. I mean, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be overly generous and say... The hardback is, you know, 25% bigger than the paperback. But I, that can't account for, you know, 200 page difference. That's how much 
of a difference footnotes makes. Uh, so, yeah. We're going to start in the hardback. I will refer to the paperback if I need to, if I'm confused. So, and the novel moved up in my um, interest level when I watched Miriam over at Miriam Elizabeth Reads. I will link her video down below on epistolary novels. And she mentioned Dracula as an epistolary novel because it's told in journal format. If I had known that earlier, it probably would have moved up on my list somewhat. The things you know. So, let's start reading. Okay, right off the bat, in, in the second paragraph, he's talking about chicken paprikash. And um, that sounds tasty. Maybe I'll go make that for dinner tonight. Okay, chicken pulled out. I have a couple of thoughts. I'm going to read you the sentence on the um, last sentence on the first page. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians as if it were the center of some sort of imaginative world. If so, my stay may be very interesting. That is an excellent descriptor for that horseshoe of the Carpathian Mountains. So far I'm invested. And I... Still not very far. I'm on page two. Um, he's talking about food again. And how paprika made him very thirsty last night. And he's had bad dreams. And it's probably because of the paprika. But then he talks about... Um, a uh, dish called mamalinga. Which I know about because of this amazing... Um, YouTuber called Beryl. I will link her channel down below. I will link the episode in which she cooks and tries Mamalinga for the first time. I, if I can get Dave to eat polenta, um, I want to try it. So we will see if I can get him to do that as part of this vlog. It is definitely not on his diet. So it may not happen. Don't get your hopes up too much. But it looks tasty. And if I can serve it with, you know, the perfectly fried egg, the chances are good that I may get him to try it. So we'll, we'll see. So far, this is um, reading like a, a travel and, and food vlog in modern day lingo. Okay, re-recording this uh, Dracula clip because, well, the first time I recorded it, it had, you know, sound you couldn't hear. Okay, I have finished. I know the mailman's about to drive by, so I'm going to have to pause when Fireball realizes that. Um, the first chapter in Dracula I finished last week, and I haven't continued past that point, so I could re-record this and not get it mixed up I am blown away by that first chapter I love the fact that Stoker decided to do this in journal format it makes it a much more intimate and personal reading experience than if it was done in the traditional third person format. The writing is 
incredibly modern and incredibly approachable and it is fantastic as I, I explained to Dave when I read that first chapter um, this very much reads like a food and travel blog in modern day terms that first chapter, there are three different mentions of food, and I'm making all of them. I made chicken paprika last night. I'm going to insert all the clips for the food as the vlog continues. There is mamalinga, which I already knew about, thanks to Beryl, who's, you know, I mentioned previously, and I will link down below in the specific episode for mamalinga. And then there was something called robber steak. Which involves bacon on a kebab and beef and, uh, yeah. As we all know, bacon is love and bacon is magic. So, bacon and beef? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm all about that. So, those clips will all be included. And the atmosphere in this book is top-notch. Like, in the first chapter, he's, you know, landed in Romania. He's traveling to Dracula's castle. And the um, locals are trying to talk him out of traveling when he's planning to because it's St. George's Day. And it's the 5th of May, and it's a, it's a very bad omen. And my liturgical calendar in my brain said, whoa, 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 St. George's Day is not the 5th of May. It is, you know, April 23rd. I did some research. I will link it down below. I now understand that reference in Dracula. I now understand that in, you know... It, it would be um, the 6th of May currently. I understand all that. And I will, you know, link that article in the description. And it, it, it was fascinating. And I learned something in just that first chapter. And the, the people he encounters, the peasants and his fellow passengers on the coach and at the inn are all so well written that their terror for him, which they never truly explain other than it's St. George's Day, leaps off the page. And as the coach is traveling through the countryside, and as darkness descends, and you, the wolves howling in the distance is described... And the flickering blue lights and it all just builds this incredibly evocative, atmospheric tension that you that 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 you know how sometimes you get that flicker of fear in your belly and you don't know why, but some instinct is telling you to don't do what you're about to do, that shows up. Even though you know it's fiction, even though you know it's just, you know, written more than a hundred years ago and it's words on a page, that he still manages to evoke that primal instinct of turn back now. Don't go forward. Turn back now. Save yourself. That's just the first chapter. You know. Chapter 2 opens up and he's arrived at Dracula's castle and he's you know doesn't know what to expect. I am so looking forward to diving in. And and uh, it is such a modern read and it is so so very evocative. I I am blown away. So I, um, yeah. 
if the experience continues like the first chapter, I'm going to have to read more Bram Stoker. And I never thought I would ever, ever say that. But it is, it is fantastic. And I am not a horror reader. However, oh, sign me up for this. So, I will let you know after I read a couple more chapters how it's going. And uh, if you don't see me before the end, I apologize, but I got lost in the story. Which is the best thing any book can do. I'm trying very hard not to let that happen, but uh, we all know that is a possibility. So, until next time. Thank you. I'm trying to capture steam because I just took the, the chicken out of the sauce. And it's delicious. You're trying to what? Take a video. Oh. Now you're all over it, but that's okay. It looks good. It's actually very good. I've had a taste. All right. It is time for a Dracula update. And what began as this wonderful modern food and travel blog immediately morphs into the next three chapters into this atmospheric, incredibly intimate, glimpse into the mind of a man as he finds himself prisoner and slowly begins to lose his mind. And it is it is not like Friday the 13th scary. It is more um, creepy and uncomfortable and, and, and just filled with language and imagery that makes you question, is he sane? Is he slowly going insane? Is he imagining everything that's happening? And you're just you're 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 just intimately drawn in to what Jonathan is experiencing in Count Dracula's castle, and it is so beautifully written. I, I was blown away, and then the focus shifts to England and a young lady named Mina Murray who is engaged to Jonathan Harker who is in Romania or I should say Transylvania and they're engaged and she is longing for his return he is well overdue she, her best friend, has three men and proposed to her on the same day, last being the man she truly loves, and she's a little bit jealous that, you know, they get to begin to plan their wedding, and Mina has to wait for Jonathan to return. And you learn some of the folklore of where they are in Yorkshire. And they're in a seaside town named Whitby. 
and it is a medieval fishing village and it you know it like all places on on a, on the coast and on the in the moors has its own local lore and you begin to learn that and it's all told through journal entries so again it is a very intimate personal dive into Mina's thought processes and what's going on with Lucy, who is her best friend and she's sleepwalking and they have to lock her in a room at night. And one night she escapes and things happen. Not to mention the incredibly beautiful language that is used when this, um, Um, sailing vessel approaches harbor and uh, crashes in the midst of a storm. And the language describing the approaching storm and how the sky changes and the wind and the, the, for lack of a better descriptor, eye of the storm passes overhead is so beautifully evocative and atmospheric. I need to read you a passage here. Let me find it. I had to flip back a couple chapters. Here we go. There's two passages. So the first is as the storm, as the sun is setting in Whitby before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the Western sky its downward way was marked by a myriad of clouds of every sunset color. Flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold. With here and there masses of not large, but seemingly absolute blackness in all sorts of shapes, as well as outlined as, as, well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The use of the word flame versus red is genius. Two colors of purple being described, again, genius. So the storm has now reached the town of Whitby and the rain and the wind have begun to lash the town. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet cloud, clouds which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death. And... Many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. Again, Stoker's language is perfection. That scene, just that, that one sentence, you get what he is trying to convey. It is a crystal clear picture in your mind and it is creepy without it being horror filled. You, you, you know, you can imagine the fog rolling in and it's wet and it's cold and it's damp and it seeps into your bones and it, you know, it, it, fog can be very, very creepy. And then there's the, um, journal entries from one of Lucy's suitors that she didn't accept his proposal, who is also the um, doctor at the local sanitarium. And he has a picture or patient he describes as suffering from homicidal and religious mania. And suddenly he's afraid that he's suffering from both afflictions at the same time and his language and his journal entries expressing his fear and dismay is 
it is so spot on. I'm about a third of the way, maybe a little over a third of the way through the book. And honestly, it is fantastic. I do not know what I was expecting. Probably something much more campy and poorly written. You know, like vampires and modern culture. And this is none of those things. I would definitely not qualify this as campy. I would not qualify this as poorly written. It would be the exact opposite. And although Dracula was not released in serial format, it was released as a complete novel. I can so picture this being released in serial format and it being read out loud, you know, amongst your family members and having to wait every month for the next installment. It would have been perfection. This is a novel meant to be read aloud. This is a novel that is meant to be experienced with other people. It is incredibly intimate and it is incredibly evocative and it is filled with atmosphere. And while I'm sitting here reading it in the bright sunshine, you know, it is late morning. I have picked it up um, well before the sun comes out and Dave is still asleep. And I don't normally read, you know, quote unquote, scary things if he's not around and he or and or he's not awake and this has not ever once made me go running for my husband you know i've never had that Aah! i you know i need to reach out and touch someone it isn't that this is if you are hesitant to pick up dracula because of its subject matter don't be Honestly, do not be. Um, this isn't anything like you would think of modern horror. It, it, it is so loosely related to what passes for horror in modern day culture that it doesn't deserve that classification, in my opinion. I'm going to go back to reading and I'll check in here again later today, I'm sure. Okay, so it is Saturday morning, and it is the morning after Robert Steak and Mama Linga for dinner, which was the preceding clip, and uh, it was delicious. Even Dave, Mr. Carnivore, was like, please, please make this again. It, it was delicious. I do have a couple of um, notes to self. The first being that, well, um, I used bamboo skewers last night. Um, next time I make it, it will be with metal skewers. A, it'll help the bacon cook faster. B, they can go in my Ninja Fugi, which I wasn't comfortable putting the bamboo skewers in there. And they're easier to poke with beef stew meat, which, you know, no matter how well you trim it, was always going to have some tough portions to poke through and the bamboo 
breaks much too easily in the process. And they'd be delicious on the grill. It was just too hot to, you know, slam them on the grill last night. That being said, they were absolutely delicious. And yep, they're really just a kebab with a, you know, paprika and bacon twist. But that paprika and bacon twist was fantastic. As for the mama linga, um, I've linked Beryl's episode down below. I did cheat a little bit last night. I did find, I had to order in some groceries. I did find a pre-made polenta that was clean and didn't have any extraneous ingredients in it. And I knew I was going to spend all day reading. So I went ahead and ordered that. I sliced it up, put it in a pan with some water to just relax the water heated those very firm polenta slices and made the um polenta i want to say mush but you know liquid form that you saw on, on dave's dinner plate and the feta cheese and the sour cream completely transformed a dish i don't really like in general um, a little butter would have helped. I, I didn't add it. I should have, but it was delicious. It would also be equally good if you got the pre-made polenta or you made polenta yourself and you put it in the fridge to harden up. If you sliced it really thin and then you fried it in butter with, um, a fried egg for breakfast with some sour cream and some feta. That salty component from the sour from the feta was delicious. I used Mexican sour cream because that's what I had in the house. And yeah, it, it was fantastic. I will be making it again. Okay, so now let's do the reading update. Okay, so reading update. I am 50 pages from completion. I will finish it today and I, I am in love with this book. I did not have great expectations going in. I'm not a vampire kind of girl, I really don't care about vampires at all. Um, if you hear the siren in the background, that just means it's noon and uh, it's the tornado siren. It happens every Saturday. Everything's fine. Um, however, this is amazing. Um, not just because it's well written. Not because it's you know, horror. I, I, I found nothing horrifying in this book. Yes, it is obvious that, you know, evil is afoot. And it's clear that he is a vampire who is attempting to, you know, turn others. However, the faith of those opposing Dracula, Van Helsing as a character. It, this book is, is fantastic. And it is a great juxtaposition of a lot of the lighter and fluffier reads I've had had of late which this isn't unusual for me um my reading tastes are changing a little bit i know this i need some more that than me and backbone to my stories and dracula has given me all of that and i am 
currently reading the book club choice for October and it is the <laughs> exact polar opposite of Dracula. It very much solidified for me that what I was already planning for 2025 was the right path for my brain to go at the moment. So stay tuned for that. That, that info is coming at um, the 12 days of Christmas, which in case anybody does not know, are the 12 days from the 26th of December through Epiphany, which is January 6th. And uh, there'll be a video every day. I have them all planned out, I think. So we're good there. I, the atmosphere and the tension and the slow ratcheting up of the danger and the peril in Dracula is so well done and such a contrast to the e-ticket ride a lot of books try to be and they just you know hurl you along at lightning speed and there's no depth to them dracula on the other hand has many layers to the onion that it is this story. There's the characters, there's the setting, there's the intimacy of the journal entries. There's the rapid, not rapid. There's the introduction of what is at the time, very modern technology. And there's the faith component and you know it starts off as this great food and travel journal you know modern day it would be a blog and it quickly changes from that to this account of our main character jonathan as he stays with Dracula and begins to you're not sure is he losing his mind is what he's going through real who is this count is he really what he's made out to be and then you know chapter five happens and you're back in England you don't know what's actually going on with Jonathan in Transylvania did he escape did he not escape where's the count to you meet Lucy and Mina and all the supporting cast in England. It is just a fantastic book. I am looking forward to the last, you know, 50 pages. I will finish it today. I have uh, fallen back in love with Victorian literature and I have others set to read it this month in October. And if they start off as well as this one, I may vlog those books as well. So uh, there may be more unexpected content coming. I've also learned, thanks to Dracula, that um, I tend to read books that have recipes in them. In fact, I have a Victorian adjacent book all about Miss Eliza's kitchen or cookbook. And there are recipes in there. And I am quite enjoying that. You know, using Dave as a guinea pig, seeing if, you know, they hold up, tasting new things. So, there will probably be more of that in vlogs of the future. And, you know, knowing my husband and that we both do better physically on carnivore, even though I'm a little less strict than he is because, well, a girl needs her chocolate and a girl needs her apples. Um... 
they'll, they'll undoubtedly be meat based. So that will, you know, work well. And if I can expand my cooking, thanks to literature, I'm all for that. And I know I'm probably reading a little women next month. And I, if my memory serves, since I read little women decades ago, I believe there's cooking in there too. So yeah, I'm looking forward to all of it. So I will update this when I finish Dracula later this afternoon. I, I lack the words. It is nothing like I assumed. It's probably nothing like most of you assume that haven't read it. Um, it's definitely one of those that I need to sit with before I write the actual blog review. It's probably going to be very different than my normal book reviews, but it, it calls for that. This book is truly just fabulous. And had it been written a hundred years later, it would be nothing like it is today. So I want to read you a couple of passages. So in this passage, Mina, who is married to Jonathan, is writing in her journal and I don't want to give away too much of the context I just want to read the passage thus we are ministers of God's own wish that the world and men for whom his son die will not be given over to monsters whose very existence would defame him he have he have allowed us to redeem one soul already and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more. Like them, we shall travel towards the sunrise. And like them, if we fail in good cause. Van Helsing is talking in Mina's journal. And this is indicative of the faith that drives this story from the outset to the conclusion. And the next passage I want to read is right at the very end. Um, where did it go? I marked the page because it was so important. Hang on. Here it is. And again, it's Mina's journal. We shall soon be off. And she's, she's the one writing it. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone knows what may be, and I pray him, with all the strength of my sad and humble soul, that he will watch over my beloved husband, that whatever may happen, Jonathan may know that I loved him and honored him more than I can say, and that my latest and truest thought will always be for him. There is this modern conception, notion that Dracula is vampire literature, and it's not. Dracula is about, obviously Count Dracula. But it's about the vampire hunters. It is about the pursuit of Dracula and the 
need to do God's work to remove the taint of evil that Dracula represents from the world so that it can't further taint future generations. This is not in any way a celebration of the vampire. It is not in any way campy or um, Twilight-esque. That there, there is nothing. Admittedly, vampire, you know, books and stories aren't my thing. I could care less. Don't watch the movie, you know, movies. I, you know, none of that interests me. However, what I know of, you know, vampire and culture, and you know, what I've heard about Twilight and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, has nothing to do with Bram Stoker's Dracula. I mean, literally, like, nothing to do with it. So, I know there are a bunch of you who have Dracula on, let's say, your anti-TBR, or you're incredibly leery about its content because of the perception of what it contains and the um, vampire portrayal in modern culture. Um, don't be. This is in no way a, a pro-vampire book. This is in no way a celebration of the vampire. This is at heart, at heart, this is a story about love. It's a story about the love between a man and a woman. It's a story about love between friends. It's about love of the deceased, God's love for us, our love for God, and the redemption of our souls. This is not about blood-sucking vampires, blood, guts, turning, all of that. No. Take everything you know about vampires and throw them out the window. And then pick up Dracula and trust me when I say that even if it is a book you think is going to challenge your faith in the end it will strengthen your faith this is a late Victorian piece of literature and It is rare to find a Victorian work that is not religious in nature, and Vamp and Dracula is no different. This, um, even the cover of, of this edition, while it is beautiful, plays into the modern perception of, you know, darkness, and, you know, there's a coffin on the spine, I don't know if you can see it from there, but there's a coffin on the spine, and that you know it plays into that you know it's got this scary castle in the you know back of the book and but this is is so much more than any of that this is a beautifully written intimate epistolary novel that is meant to be read aloud and it is meant to be thought-provoking and 
yes, it's a little scary and it's a little creepy and the tension builds up and but it's it's never over the top and it's never campy and it's never um ridiculous or overly violent or overly sexual or any of those things that you know go with modern vampires it is instead just this deeply meaningful moving adventure story with unexpected religious overtones and unexpected um, romance and, and I don't mean sappy kissy romance I mean romance that lasts a lifetime and I didn't know this about Stoker but his ability to write beautifully in English and then he does all of these Van Helsing is Dutch and he writes beautiful um, Dutch English for lack of a better way to phrase it and yet he also does other you know regional English dialects in the book and they're all different from each other and his ability to do that is astounding. I am just, I'm blown away. And now I need to read the rest of what is in this book. Um, so there is Dracula, obviously. And then there's the Jewel of Seven Stars, the Lair of the White Worm, and then a series of um, short stories under the major title of Dracula's Guest and Other Stories. And I will be reading more of Stoker. I did not anticipate that when I started this. I anticipated, you know, I was going to read it and I would either love it or hate it, but did not expect to fall in love with Stoker's writing. And I did. I flat out fell in love with Stoker's writing. And as you know, I originally purchased the um, Ignatius Critical Edition, which has footnotes at the end of, you know, every page where they seemed appropriate. And so there are three contemporary criticisms contained in this. So the first one is religion and superstition in Bram Stoker's Dracula, and then cinematic Dracula from Nesterafu to Bram Stoker's Dracula. The last essay is Professor, Psycho Research Agent Detective and Helsing's role in Dracula. So I will probably read those over the course of the um, month. I don't think any of them are very long. Yeah, they're not very long because the text in this book is And much larger font and it takes up you know counts far more pages so uh, the essays all in total are less than 100 pages so they'll be fairly quick reads but um and next time i may read if i reread this i may read it with footnotes but i will tell you that um my initial assessment at chapter one that it reads like a modern novel uh, I'm not changing that opinion it absolutely to me does read like a modern novel from beginning to end I at no point had to go look up language or meaning or you know any of that stuff it it was fantastic I It was this, or is this incredibly 
wonderfully immersive reading experience, even in the bright sunshine of a early fall Texas. Um, that's fine. It doesn't matter. It it was just immersive, and I can Im imagine um, if it's a true version of of Stoker's text and not an abridged version, the audiobook may be very good. But I do know I I will always first recommend reading this one physically first. It it was. Fantastic. Um, I, you know, if you are afraid to read Dracula because of its content, I don't think there is anything in there that's going to upset anyone. This is, at its heart, a religious novel. I don't know another way to put it. So, I hope you enjoyed this vlog. I hope, uh... You all got a glimpse of uh, some of the food that appears in the first chapter. Please do go check out Beryl's video on Mamalinga. All of her amazing videos are, are fun, and if you're interested in cooking that, it's a it's a, an example of it. And uh, thank you, Lou, for you know suggesting that I read it. I would not have done so otherwise, and I am better for it, and I am very much in the mood to read classic lit. Uh, this book would not have been written today. So, leave a comment down below, like and subscribe, and I will see you here next time at the protagonist pub. Come on girls, eat! Good girl, Wheezy. Yeah, molten chickens are no joke, folks. Sweetie has completely lost her tail feathers. That'll be gone by an hour.